<laughs> yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, as I was introduced, I was, uh, spent a lot of time in trade unions. I was an international executive for my union for 25 years. And I've been to many, many meetings where minutes were presented. The first time ever that the minutes wasn't read, but it was agreed to sign as an accurate uh, record of the meeting, which uh, must be a, a, a record itself. <laughs> Euroscepticism, I prefer uh, to say it is anti-EU, because as uh, Israel was saying, it's not Europe, it is actually the EU. So it's not so much I'm a Eurosceptic, but I'm anti, anti the EU. And the EU has nothing to offer, neither does do anything or represent, can represent anything that anybody on the left, no matter where he or she is on the spectrum, can, appear, can, can find appealing. And the opposition to the European Union goes back a long way. I'm not talking about just Tony Benn and others, but trying right back to 1950 when the origins of the European Union started with the Schumann Declaration. It was a French foreign minister who proposed to place French and German production of coal and steel under one common high authority. And this now led over the years to common market and then the European Union. And it was Attlee then who said that there is no way Britain could accept that the most vital economic forces of this country be handed over to an authority that's utterly undemocratic and irresponsible for no one. And that applies today to the European Union as well as it applied to the Schumann Declaration then. I'm going to deal with a number of topics. Um, um, to show where the left stands as far as, these, as far as the EU is concerned on these topics. Democracy, independence and sovereignty, economic model, employment, workers' rights and so on, and maybe, if the time permitted, internationalism and the environment. On the question of democracy, um, we have votes, and the European Union do have votes, but they have a rule, a criteria, that if the world goes the wrong way, they don't accept it, and therefore they are either uh, um, neglected or they ask the people to vote again. And this happens over and over again. In, in Greece, for instance, not only they elected the government, anti-austerity, but they actually had a referendum about the terms of the bailout that was shot so harsh, and 60 or 65 percent voted to reject it. What does the EU do? It, in fact, it was even harsher. Uh, terms uh, and conditions on, on, on the bailout. And now we find uh, uh, um, it's happening similarly in, in Italy. Uh, um, it, uh, uh, um, and of course in Greece, uh, in, in uh, uh, Ireland they had a vote that wasn't accepted and they had to vote again in France similarly. So democracy doesn't go hand in hand with the, with the European Union. And compare this with democracy here. We had a, have a referendum, 52% vote to leave. The Prime Minister resigns because the people uh, didn't take his advice. A new government is formed. Parliament, who 80% of them voted to remain, then 80% of them vote to invoke Article 50. Why? Because they were instructed by the people to do so. They didn't say go and vote again. They, they, they are instructed by the people to vote. And, uh, and now the process of coming out of the EU is going through Parliament um, uh, through the EU withdrawal bill. And of course there are attempts to uh, subvert the border, attempts to keep us in or a bit in the, in the European Union, in the single market, in the customs union, so on and so forth. In my opinion, none of this will come to pass for a simple reason that it's not going to be accepted by the British people is the depth of democracy here that it would not be accepted in the queue to Tesco when you check out. It's not going to expect accepted in the local pub that the people voted and Parliament then goes against it. Uh, uh, and compare that with the EU now. I prefer this type of democracy. And I think the EU falls down completely, completely on, on democratic aspect. Independence and sovereignty. It is 
a cause that the left supported over centuries, certainly in the 20th century, lots of uh, wars of independence, struggles for liberation, colonies got the independence, and so on. And who gave them the support, who gave the people support? Well, the left. Brexit isn't that different. It's called the Brexit is an exit from the EU. India, you can say, is exiting, which had to tell you depending on what's exiting, the British Empire. It's similar. We also are want control back, that is we want our independence and sovereignty to decide things for ourselves and not someone else who is not accountable. And that's the reason why you find that the left and the right on the aspect of sovereignty uh, uh, are combined. You know, it goes across. Uh, um, conservatives, Labour, trade unionists, left and right. The, uh, the economic model and the fiscal, uh, fiscal policies of the EU. The, the part of the EU is the single market and its rules. And the single market design is well to provide the, the, the easiest way uh, uh, for corporations cooperation to, to, to make profit. The most unhindered environment for, for corporations to actually make profit. It's based on the four freedoms, which I'm sure many of you probably will have heard of. These four freedoms are freedom of uh, movement of goods, freedom of movement of services, freedom of movement of capital, and freedom of movement of labor. The goods and services, the effect of it is that goods can then go across, undercut uh, local productions, local goods, and, there, and, and uh, uh, therefore uh, uh, create uh, uh, um, closures and, and uh, poverty in some areas. Goods can move in uh, uh, from economies that are low-wage economies to somewhere else. Capital can move. Capital has the freedom to move around it wants. So if it finds difficulties in one area, all it has to do is move to another one, regardless of the effect on the economy locally, on the effect of society there, on, on, on the deprivation that's created. Now, capital is not created by capitalists. It's not, cooperation doesn't actually have capital, they borrow it. Where does capital come from? Capital uh, 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 is a product of is, is, is representation of wealth. Some of it is is a product of, of people working people. Some of it is pensions. Pension forms a large part of actual capital. The other part is profits that have been accumulated over decades, two or three centuries since the Industrial Revolution. Profits are created, they're invested, more profits are created. And the profits and all production were created by working people, the 99% who actually work. So capital is a product of society. It's a social product that is in the hands of private capitalists or corporations. And society, therefore, has every right to control it. Capital should not have the right to move anywhere it wants just because it can make a bit of profit somewhere else. Now, that sounds like as if it's a very noble idea, but in fact, that was, we had exchange, capital exchange control in, in the 70s. It was when Thatcher was elected that capital exchange controls were, were removed and capital can then move. Previously, capital could not move from one place to another. And if you don't allow, if you allow capital to move anywhere, anywhere you want, you then lose the possibility of any uh, uh, um, um, industrial strategy. You can't then work out that in certain area there will be some work. So you can have areas where they are completely, they are devastated. The southern Europe is like that, where capital has moved out uh, uh, to, to, to another area. And you have what's, what's now known here, for instance, that the imbalance. So our manufacturing industry is destroyed. It wasn't just by accident. That was a result of precisely the, the, the freedom uh, of capital to move from one area to the other. And then we have the freedom of movement of labor, which is the, probably the most pernicious one, whereby it gives you the impression that labor has been chained, can't move, and now therefore the chains are being broken, and they can actually 
now have freedom to move. But in fact, it's exactly the other way around. Labor is chained to capital, so therefore, if capital moves, labor must move with it. It isn't a freedom. In fact, it's an enforced movement of labor. The lad who comes and cleans the windows from Romania in our house, and do you think that when he was 14 and his teacher asked, what would you like to do in the future? He said, well, my ambition is to clean windows in North London. No, he's forced to actually move there. He's forced to go because there is no work in, in Romania. And as Gisela was saying, uh, we now uh, um, have, uh, this is a, a, a report from, uh, in, in the Guardian, we said that EU-trained nurses and health visitors, health visitors working in the NHS have soared by 32% in March this year. Do you really think that those nurses and health workers will, will uh, not wanted in, in, in Eastern Europe? We are getting people who are needed in their own country to build their own countries, we're bringing them here in the state. Which is of course not something that's uh, uh, good for us, or good for the country where they come from. The effect of free movement of labor is to depress wages here, to put pressure on, on housing, on social services, and, and on welfare. So on that account, the, the uh, left should be opposed to the single market, and, and that means the EU. The customs union is a consequence of the single market, so the same rules apply. The result of the combination of these rules is that if we want to change economic policy, if supposing we elect a Labour government with an economic strategy whereby you can have a, a rebalancing the economy, borrowing based state aid and so on, we won't be able to do it while you are in the EU because these rules are not just policies by the EU, they are written in the Constitution itself. Nowhere, there's no other organization whereby the economic policy is actually written in the Constitution. So socialism, doesn't matter what type you think about, socialism is unconstitutional inside the EU, no matter who you elect, what government you actually elect. Now, I could go through, it sometimes is argued that no, 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 you can do all of this. Thing. You can have nationalization under, under EU rule and so on. All you have to do is search it on the website of the EU itself and you'll find that state ownership, for instance, which is nationalization, can happen, but it has to be in a competitive market with the strict rules of competitive tender, which means really you're not in control of it. It's not really publicly owned. Um, borrowing to invest, the EU sets limits to state deficit as a percentage of GDP, so you can't borrow as much as you want, there's a certain limit. And this is a problem that uh, Spain and Italy and uh, Greece and so on had, whereby they are limited to how much they can borrow uh, in order to invest. And of course, state aid uh, is not allowed under Article 107, there's a general prohibition, but the exemptions can apply. Of course, exemption that the rule itself is, is a prohibition of it. Employment. Employment, uh, on, 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 on unemployment, the EU is very, very big. I mean, there you have, in 1927, you have 7.3% unemployment throughout the EU. And the euro zone itself is 86 the number of people unemployed in total is something like 18 million. 18 million people unemployed in the EU. That is Finland, Sweden, and Norway added together. All of that, not a single person with a job. You think crime is even worse. Uh, in Greece, it's 42 percent. In Italy, 31 percent, and so on. Now that is not a mistake. That is not. They just done something wrong or, or something. That is the effect of the economic rules that the EU established, it's precisely. And the reason for it is actually simple. If you have a large body of unemployed people, therefore you have large pool of labor, and therefore, not only wages will be depressed, 
when conditions would be, would be depressed and a profit, more and more profits can be made. And coupled with that, in spite of what many people, what some people say, the EU is not a protector of workers' rights at all. In fact, it is exactly the opposite. What's happening, what's happening in Greece, where collective bargaining was stopped, collective agreements were, were, were abolished, what's happened in, in, in uh, France now, Italy, the, the, the uh, um, code of labor being uh, abolished and changed. Uh, uh, um, and what's happening in Eastern Europe as well, as the new member joined the EU. So the, the, the employment rights are threatened and attacked continuously under the EU. And, and Corbyn was right when he said that the only way to protect workers' rights is, of course, when we are in charge of our own actions outside the single market. We are the only people who can protect workers' rights, as we did all along, as the trade union movement did all along. It is any change, and coming out of the European Union is a big change, any rebalancing of our relationships with the rest of the world, any re rebalancing of our economy, will obviously uh, uh, um, take some effort and also be costly. There is no change without any cost. So we can't pretend that coming out of the EU will be all fine. There will be some cost. There will be some hardship involved by definition. But if you look at all the countries that have been through these changes, where they sort of uh, uh, threw away their dependence on, on, on uh, colonies and they got their own independence, the, the cost was, of course, worth it. Because at the end of it all, you're going to have a different starting point, a starting point whereby you can actually build the economy and the society you live in. And in summary, is this. What the Brexit will, will, will provide us is a new relationship, and that must mean a bit more of self-reliance rather than the complete reliance, not complete, but a large reliance on the outside world. And this was brought up by globalization, whereby we're dependent on gas from, from uh, Russia and on a variety of things from other countries, even when not sufficient in food production. Uh, uh, um, th that, given the situation now, the new situation in the world, and with uh, uh, um, treaties being abandoned, as, as uh, the United States is doing in terms of uh, Iran or in terms of, of uh, tariffs on steel and so on, it's more and more important for a country like ours to have more, rely more on itself and do things here rather than depending on other countries. There's absolutely no reason why, if you make a car, why components and parts of a car should crisscross the channel to the, to the continent to add bits and pieces on it in, say, Frankfurt, and then come back here and something else added to it, and then goes back there, and so on and so forth. There's absolutely no reason why that should happen. The only reason why it happens is because it makes tiny bit increase in the, in the profit margin. What, we can make, what can be made here should be made here rather than depending on, our, on, on other countries. And that is a new relationship that must underpin, must underpin our exit uh, from the European Union. So all of this, it is surprising to me that anybody who calls themselves left should want to have anything to do with the EU because it falls down on all these aspects that I said democracy, independence, employment, workers' <coughs> rights, the environment, as well as, as any sense of internationalism. Thank you.